Uh, welcome to the 11th hearing of the Public Accountability Committee's inquiry into the government's management of the COVID-19 pandemic. The inquiry is intended to provide ongoing parliamentary oversight of the government's response to the unfolding pandemic. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people, who are the tra traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respect and those of the committee and those in attendance to the Elders past, present and emerging of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to those other Aboriginal persons present. Today is an opportunity for the Government to respond to the evidence the Committee heard at its last two public hearings. This morning we'll hear from witnesses from the Communities and Justice portfolio, including the Minister for Families, Communities and Disability Services, the Honourable Gareth Ward. Uh, in the afternoon, government witnesses will be invited to respond to the very concerning evidence we've recently received from peak bodies, industry associations and venue operators across live music, arts and the nighttime economy. This will include evidence from the Minister for Customer Service, the Honourable Victor Dominello, uh, the Minister with Responsibility for the Arts, the Honourable Don Harwin, MLC, and the Minister for Health and Medical Research, the Honourable Brad Hazard, MP. Today's hearing is broadcast via the Parliament's website. The trans transcript of today's hearing will be placed in the committee's website when it becomes available. In accordance with the broadcasting guidelines, while members of the media may film or record members and witnesses, people in the public gallery should not be the primary focus of any filming or photography. Of course, we have no one in the public gallery because it's closed to the public today, so I'll put a line for that. Um, um, I'd also remind media representatives they must take responsibility for what they publish about the committee's proceedings. It's important to remember that parliamentary privilege does not apply to what witnesses may say outside of their evidence at the hearing, and so I urge witnesses to be careful about any comments you may make to the media or to the others after you complete your evidence. The guidelines for broadcast of proceedings are available from the Secretariat. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness, according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018. There may be some questions that a witness could only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, witnesses are advised that they can take the question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days. Of course, if answers can be provided before then, that's much appreciated by the committee. I remind everyone here today that committee hearings are not intended to provide a forum for people to make adverse reflections about others. Um, all witnesses that, in, that, and I, I remind committee members that um, <laughs> of, of the same thing, including the chair. Um, all witnesses from departments, statutory bodies or corporations will be sworn prior to giving evidence. Minister, I remind you that you do not need to be sworn as you have already sworn an oath to your office as a member of parliament. And similarly, Mr Coots Trotters, you've already been sworn before this inquiry. So for those other witnesses, I could ask you to state your full name, position, title and agency, and then take either an oath or an affirmation, the words in front of you. And Ms Check, we'll just start with you and work across. Thank you, Mr Shoebridge. Simone Louise Check, Deputy Secretary, Child Protection and Permanency, District and Youth Justice Services. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thanks, Ms Check. Paul Vivas, Deputy Secretary for Housing, Disability and District Services, Department of um, Communities and Justice. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Ms Walker. Um, thank you. Uh, Simone Louise Walker, uh, Deputy Secretary, Strategy Policy, Commissioning, Department of Communities and Justice. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thanks very much. Uh, Minister, did you want to start with a brief opening? Otherwise, we'll go straight to questions. Yes, I would, if that's all right, Mr Chairman. Yes. Look, um, can I also join with you in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and thank them for their custodianship of the country? Um, can I just say, uh, firstly, uh, an enormous thank you to the... Uh, social and community services sector across our state. Uh, I know that members of the committee um, in all of your various ways are interested in, in this portfolio and the important role that it plays, but I think it would be remiss of me without saying, I'm sure on behalf of all of us here, an enormous thank you to the wonderful work of our frontline staff during this very difficult time. It has been uh, an incredible period um, in our history and they have stepped up. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's colleagues uh, across the agency or um, the uh, people who we have working so hard through our, our non-government organisations. Um, we've seen an incredible response from the sector and I've really appreciated particularly working very closely um, with not just members of parliament from right across the political divide uh, during this period, including my shadow ministers, but also um, with the peaks themselves. And uh, I want to thank um, people like Catherine McKernan from Homelessness New South Wales, Mark Denitani from CHIA, 
um, uh, Leo uh, Patterson Ross from Tenants Union, uh, also the unions that um, have been on my sector calls, um, particularly Nirel Clay from the ASU and Natalie Lang, as well as Stuart Little from the, the PSA. Um, but also um, organisations like the Office of the Children's Guardian uh, and Janet Scorer and uh, the Advocate for Children and Young People, Zoe Robertson, the um, Commissioner for Ageing and Disability, uh, Robert Fitzgerald, um, but also the uh, Advocate for groups like um, Aqua and Steve Kidman. Um, we've just had such a, uh, an important collaboration during this time and uh, they've been incredibly helpful in supporting me and my team, but also... Uh, government agencies work closer together and I think that collaboration has been really important. Um, I'd be the first to say, Mr Chairman, that um, there would be things, when I look back, that we may do differently and uh, we may not have always gotten it right, but I think that collaboration, that, that close working relationship that's been enjoyed uh, has meant that we've done the very best that we can through what has been a, a very difficult period. And I also want to thank the executive team at the table, led by uh, the Secretary, Mr Coots Trotter, uh, who have also worked incredibly hard during what has been uh, a, a horrendous time for the state, but also for our state's most vulnerable. And I'm sure we would all agree that during events like this, it's um, often the most vulnerable that experience the greatest hardship. But um, we've done our very best to make sure that um, that could be uh, responded to as best we can. And again, I just want to reiterate my sincere thanks to all of the colleagues across the sector that have done a phenomenal job. Um, well, thank you, Minister. I'm, I'm sure that support for the vulnerable and what support is being delivered will be a focus of this morning's questioning. So I'll hand over to uh, Penny Sharp. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Hello, everyone. What would you have done differently, Minister? <laughs> I thought I might um, <laughs> be leading uh, that question on. Look, um, I think that that's for others to, to speculate on. I can't change the past, Ms Sharp. Yeah, I, um, I'm actually not. It's, it's not meant as a, no. as, an, as a trap for you to walk into. No, I, no. I think that the reflection and the work that you've done with the sector and... Um, you know, with 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 the workforce has actually been mostly a very positive yeah. thing. So, I am actually genuinely interested in your reflection on what you know, what do you think you could have you know what would you have done differently given that we've had a bit of time to think about it. Uh, look, I'm still reflecting on that. Um, I'm, I'm here to obviously answer evidence about what we have done, uh, not what I would have done differently. Um, I think that I'll leave that to my own personal reflection and work over the coming weeks and months. But suffice to say. Um, I'm very grateful uh, for, for your comments there, particularly in relation to the workforce, but uh, the, pers the people who have done the hard work are the people on the front lines. So, um, look, I think uh, I've worked as hard as I can, Ms Sharp, over the last few months. Um, I've worked as closely with the front line as I can, um, but I'll be reflecting on what I could have done differently um, over, over the weeks and months ahead as I continue to consult with the sector. Well, I might ask you again at estimates and see if you had time for further reflection. I'm sure you will. <laughs> uh, you're disappointed that there's no, lack of, there's no funding for social housing in the federal budget? Uh, Ms Sharp, this is a committee on what's happened in relation to COVID, not the federal budget, which was handed down last night. We met well, at 9.30 okay. this morning. I think it's um, outside of the committee's remit to go to that particular point right now. But uh, I would say that I noted in the federal budget, anecdotally, if you're going to ask me on the fly, uh, there was an additional billion-dollar allocation towards NIFIC uh, for the expansion of uh, the partnership between governments and the community housing sector. Um, so any investment in social housing is welcome. But you acknowledge that there's no money, actually, in terms of infrastructure funding to build more? I acknowledge the federal budget is a matter for the Commonwealth. That's great. Right. Minister, um, uh, on a similar vein, and given your answer, I'm not sure that I'm going to get an answer, there's been uh, issues raised about the changes to job seeker and job keeper and the rising level of poverty that will particularly impact on families in Western Sydney. Um, is your department uh, thinking about that and what are you putting in place to manage that? Oh, absolutely. Look, um, can I uh, just indicate to you that um, the community services ministers hadn't been getting together prior to COVID and uh, it was at my instigation that we actually started to meet monthly uh, from colleagues right across all states and territories with the Commonwealth and um, I'm proud of the fact that we um, certainly led on things like um, uh, supports for vulnerable families, but things like childcare um, and the need sure. to provide... Sure, Minister, that's not my question. My question is that we've got reports about increasing poverty, going to hit single mums and particularly their kids very hard in Western Sydney, um, and I'm wanting to know what, uh, so what, what you're doing about that. subsidies for childcare aren't going to help families in Western Sydney? 
Sure, sure. that's fine. Right. But that doesn't actually stop people who currently aren't working, who can't work, who are about to have their job seeker cut in half, and, and, and their single parents. And, that's what I'm asking you about. And I'm sure you would appreciate, Ms Sharp, that um, matters concerning... Job keeper and job seeker are matters for the Commonwealth, and I continue to have a dialogue with my federal colleagues in relation to those matters. But in relation to poverty uh, and supporting people, um, we announced very early on additional support for organisations like Food Bank and Aust Harvest. There was a, an additional ten million dollars yep. to provide support. Very welcome and very important. And, and so, given oh. given that the, given the the need for that, and as you know, um, people have seen increased. There's also a whole group of people mm -hmm. that um, don't qualify. For any, for any federal assistance that are making use of that. Um, are you expecting that you're going to have to put more money into programs like that as a result of the changes to JobSeeker and JobKeeper? Oh, well, look, obviously we haven't seen the impacts of any Commonwealth changes at this point, but I think as I've demonstrated, Ms Sharp, I'm happy to um, argue for supports that I believe will make a difference, and we have delivered those changes and investments. Uh, but I would hate to think that you would waste your time on questions concerning the Commonwealth rather than questions concerning my responsibilities as Minister during Well, this I don't period. think wasting time about worrying about poor single mothers in Western Sydney is a waste of time, I think Minister. that would be an appalling mischaracterisation well, of what I was just well, suggesting, and I think you know that. Well, you're trying to divert what, what, what I'm actually asking no, about I'm is similar to that. you hold me Well, actually I actually want to ask about housing. I want to ask about housing. Um, Minister... The housing waiting list, as I understand it, online hasn't been updated since June 2019. Are you able to give us the latest figures in relation to the housing waiting list? Uh, the latest information I have is the crisis waiting list is around 4,600, Mr Vivers. Um, the last published figure, Minister, yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can, yeah, and the general applications? Oh, I'd have to ask Mr Sorry, did you yeah. say 4,600? Yes, the, for the crisis waiting list, yes. Can I say that the, the waiting list is typically updated in November each year for the previous June? As part of the annual report? As part of the mm -hmm. annual report. Yeah, so that's that's why I'm asking, because I know that it hasn't been up. We haven't got any figures since June 19, and obviously things have the changed. The reason why it's called the annual report is it's published annually. Yes, thank you for that, <coughs> Mr. I'm just well aware of that, but I also am aware that Mr. Vivas is a very good public servant who actually knows what the figures would be currently Exceptional and would be able to provide that to the committee. Exceptional public servant. So, can I just be clear? The 4,600 was as at 30 June. Right. The last published report. As at 30 June? I think it's yes. yeah. yeah. And you don't have any updated you don't have the. Uh, you don't have any... We published the figures in accordance yes, with... Yes, I'm not asking about the published the figures. figures. I'm asking about the current figures, yeah. which I'm sure that you have. And this is um, the accountability measures that we have in place that we publish, and uh, I'm citing the most recent figures no, but, that but, I have available. But, Minister, one of the reasons we're having this hearing is to work out what the impact of the pandemic is. Mm. So Ms Sharp is perfectly within her rights to ask Absolutely. what if any not, current I'm, figures you have. I'm not denying that. And I'm just telling you that the latest figures that I have, yeah. and I've just given those to you. And so can you provide... A more up to date set of figures, the most up to date set of figures. I've just provided now, you the most up to date figures. No, they're not the up to date figures, they're the published figures. Uh, can we, uh, point of order, um, I've let a couple go through to the keeper, but I think that in our enthusiasm we might might be wise to have one person ask the question and just um, to have a respectful tone in doing so. We have plenty well, of time. Thank you, and I appreciate uh, that. But the, the Minister, I think, is is not, not trying to answer Ms. Sharp's question. So I'll let Ms. Sharp ask it again. Well, Which I think Chair, is a perfectly Chair, reasonable is, question, Ms Sharp. Chair, my point is that um, I ask that through you, one member ask a question at a time. Yes, and I'm handing it to Ms Sharp to ask again the very reasonable question that she's now asked three times. So as we're trying to oversight what's happened with COVID, we know that housing has been a massive issue. We know that people have been um, unable to pay their rent. We know that people have had to change their living circumstances. We know that there's been a massive effort, which I'll get to in a minute, which I'm sure we'll be very happy to talk about, Minister, around homelessness and what we've done with rough sleepers. My question is, are there any further updated figures that you can provide the committee um, on the, what, that, what has happened to the priority list and to the general applications list for housing within New South Wales. The latest figures, which I have, um, which were the, the most published figures, are the 4,484 priority and the 46,530 general applications. I'm wanting to understand, and perhaps Mr Vivas can do it, even if you can't give me the exact figure, what the movement in that has been over the COVID period. I'm not trying to be tricky. I just gave you the latest figures that I had. I made that clear when I answered the question. I'm happy to take the question on notice. I'm not asking you. I'm asking Mr Vivas. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr Vivas. So I have no further figures here. Um, the figures are published every November. But 
Minister, I understood you'd take it on notice to see if you've got a more current set of figures. Y yes, Mr Chairman, I just said that I would. Um, Minister, can I just ask, does that mean you haven't requested uh, any updated figures since that? Uh, Mr Graham, I, I, um, uh, we have, we have a, a process for reporting the data which is transparent. I, beyond what we've always done, I don't have anything in addition to that. But at no point during this you've, you haven't asked what's happening to the waiting lists as a result of COVID, given that you've moved a lot of people, rough, rough, rough sleepers, into vacant premises. We talked about this That's last time you were question. here, Mr Beavers. That's a different well, question. Well, no. I want to know how many people are now on the priority list and how many people are on the general list and what impact that has had. And I've advised you for the latest figures. Oh. I don't think you gave us the general list. No, you didn't give it. No, you haven't given us. I gave you the figure. Well, no, I, I think if you review the handset, I indicated quite clearly without even referring to my notes what the um, the latest figure was in relation to uh, crisis housing. But yeah, not into general applications, no. uh, yeah, Yes, and I think, Mr Bivers, do you have the answer to that? Uh, so, I, 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 the latest figures, the published figures... So the 46,530 would be accurate. Yeah. Can I just answer <coughs> Mr Graham's question, though? Yes, I have requested the data to, to directly answer your question. Yes, I have. And have you received it? No, I don't. That's why I've given the most up-to-date information. So you, you've requested but have not received any updates? Not, on not that. yet, but as you can imagine, the data changes constantly. Something that hasn't flown across your desk, though. Mr Graham, the um, housing data is released in a transparent way, as it always has been. And I'm not seeking to disguise anything. We're doing things as we always have. I've offered to take the question on notice, and I'm happy to update the committee further. Well, you take a lot of things on notice. You don't necessarily provide us with the information, but that's fine. I'll, oh, I'll move on, on. Come on. Well, I'll, I'll get, we'll get to I that later. I always respond to your we'll questions get, we'll get to on that notice. Later. No, you don't. Um, 70, uh, so 70 million dollars was um, announced for COVID-related activities. Are you available to provide the committee a breakdown in the costing for the temporary accommodation since March? Uh, the 70 million dollars, just to be clear, that that was that was just in relation to the housing and homelessness response. Uh, yep. 34 million dollars of which was for the immediate response, which related to uh, things like temporary accommodation and the additional support for rent choice, rent choice youth, and start safely. Um, since uh, April 1, we've supported, I'm sure Mr McPeters will correct me if I'm wrong, but it's about 23,000 people with either uh, temporary accommodation or um, supports into um, some form of housing with Together Home. Um, in relation to... Sorry, just to be clear, 20, when you say 23,000 people, that would, is that would, some of that would be repeat. That's not 20,000 individual people, is that 23,000... Um, no, that, that, that is unique. Yeah. It's unique That's people. Yeah. Okay. So, so just to be clear, so um, around 3,300, Mr Vivers, are rough sleepers? Uh, off the top of my head? Yes, 3,320. Yep. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, that, that's the, the rough sleeper component. Just to put that into context, Ms Sharp, I mean, that's, that's a, a hell of a lot of work into a very short period of time. And we've done that through upscaling assertive outreach. So um, uh, when I became the minister, we were doing assertive outreach in Sydney. We've expanded that program to places like Newcastle, the Tweed, and I think around 36 local government areas yep. across the state. Um, so... That was the component of the Would first... You, sorry, that, can I just answer the question? Uh, you can, but, just, uh, but if you could provide us a breakdown, particularly with that regional, in terms of where assertive outreach has actually reached people, I'm very interested. It's a much-needed thing. Uh, look, there, there was 36 areas, so I'm happy to take that question on yep, notice and provide right. you the data. But, so the first announcement was the $34 uh, million, um, and that was in relation to the temporary accommodation uh, and uh, the immediate supports. The $36 million, so that... Some, that's the, the total of the 70 million you're asking about. Yep. That was for Together Home. So yes. most of that money goes towards the wraparound support services um, that people need to sustain tenancies because, as you and I would both agree, people who are rough sleepers are there because of a symptom of another issue domestic violence, drug and alcohol addiction, family violence, financial hardship, um, uh, mental illness. So uh, the. Um, uh, that, that money is going towards sustaining those tenancies and, and keeping people... How many people have gotten a tenancy under well, the program? Well, I'll, I'll take the point of order. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm not <coughs> trying to be tricky. No, no, I know you're not trying to be tricky. Uh, I, think, I think it's well made, yeah. so we can just move on. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm happy to answer the question. Um, so in relation to Together Home, we've supported uh, to date uh, 377 people um, who were rough sleepers that are now in um, accommodation. And just, just to put that into context, um, there, I think, I think um, to 2019, and again, Mr Vebers will correct me if I'm wrong, we'd helped about 700 rough sleepers into full-time accommodation? Um, it was actually a bit more than that, Minister. Over the last year, it was just around 1,000. Just around 1,000. But, but to, to put that into context, yeah. 377 in just a few months, 
into accommodation who are rough sleepers is a phenomenal effort and it's a great credit to our assertive outreach teams uh, and our homelessness teams across the state. Yep, that's terrific. Can I just clarify, when they're in the Together Home program, that's actually put into a tenancy as opposed to temporary accommodation arrangements? So, so they're transitioned from temporary accommodation? Yeah, yeah that's just what I'm trying to, to say. So to a, to, if I've finished, no, to, to, a, to a tenancy which is head leased through community housing yep. providers. Yep. Yep. And 377 people are either supported in temporary accommodation with wraparound supports or housed. So of that number, 234 people are now in their own homes. <clears throat> and the balance between that and 377 are in temporary accommodation but receiving wraparound supports and are soon to move into head leased accommodation. Some leases are yet to be finalised though, yep. I think. Yeah, yep. yep. no, that's fine. Um, and do you have figures on how people have been able to maintain that? Like, do you actually have <coughs> figures on numbers where that placement's broke, where the transit's broken down? Yeah, that's a really good question. Look, it's still early days yet. Um, the, I've got some anecdotal stories of where people have moved into homes and have gone back to sleep on the street, yep. um, but uh, I, I don't have that, but I'm happy to take that on notice and get back to you. Yep. If, if I could add to that, in our normal assertive outreach programs, so co -co this program aside, yep. um, we retain about 95% of yep. people. It's, it's an amazing mm. figure. Um, so once we stabilise people in temporary accommodation, we usually got them and we keep them. Uh, we don't keep everybody in temporary accommodation. Some no. people do disappear. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 that's good. That's good. They're, they're, they're very good figures. Mm. Um, I wanted to... Sorry, I've got one more question just on the housing stuff, which is... Um, so those that are not in the home, the Together Home program, so we've got 377, you've housed about 3,320, so there's just under about 2,000... Sorry, just under 3,000 rough sleepers. How, how is the transition post-COVID? What are you doing? Is everyone still in temporary accommodation? What is the proposed, I suppose, rollback of, and timing of that, of that? Well, obviously, we're seeking to transition as many people as, as we can. There are some people that are still... But you don't have 3,000 housing units that you can put people No, that, that's into. right. That's right. And that, mm. that's obviously going to be a challenge, but it's still the largest single investment we've made in rough sleeping in the state. And you get a tick for that, Minister. I'm just wanting to know, though, how you're going to manage from here. Yeah, look, obviously we, we want to house as many people as I, as I can, Ms Sharp, and we're, we're doing the best we can with what we have available and what sure, we've been what's the timing in terms of the temporary accommodation it's arrangements? Uh, so temporary accommodation, for people who are sleeping rough, as long as they work with us, we maintain them in temporary accommodation until we've got a housing yeah. solution. Uh, we do have 7,000 vacancies a year in public housing. People who are sleeping rough obviously are very high uh, at the top of that queue. Um, and some rough sleepers are also able to manage in private rental accommodation. Uh, n not a huge number, sure. uh, but we have assisted around about 200 <coughs> rough sleepers during COVID into private accommodation, sometimes boarding so, houses. So, sorry, that's that's the different 200 than to the Together Home program? Yes, yeah. 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 So yeah. that's yeah. an additional 200, yeah. Yeah. right? Sorry, yep, no, but that's... The, yeah. It's, it's yeah. 147. No. Yep, no, that's OK. Yeah. Still pretty good. Yep. We have assisted um, in, into private rental mm. accommodation. Yep, yeah. OK. Um, but what is... Are you able to give... You, the money is finite. Um, there's, you've, you've yeah. injected significant money, which is very welcome and have been very important during COVID, um, as things are, fingers crossed, getting better, surely you're not going to be able to maintain 3,300 people in temporary accommodation. What's the sort of, what is, what is the plans for transition out of that? So if, if, if I can say the vast majority of people who come into temporary accommodation need temporary accommodation for a small number of nights to sort themselves out. These are sometimes people who've had a breakup with their family, sometimes young people who've broken up with their family. Sometimes five or six days in temporary accommodation is enough time for them to reconcile with their family and go back. Yeah. We do approach, so since COVID, we've contracted Nehemiah to contact everybody who comes into temporary accommodation and ask them if they need support around about 20% of people then ask for support, which is either um, financial support into private sector or into social housing. So I'm not just talking about yep. sleepers here, I'm talking everyone. Yep. 
Uh, as at last night, we had about 920 families in temporary accommodation. So the number of people in temporary accommodation has gone down uh, from... Uh, 50, about 1,500 yeah. at the peak. At the, uh, mm. So mm. it's yeah. reduced. And most of that is people resolving their own need. People who are in shared accommodation, for example, uh, it fell over, they need a bit of time to get another shared accommodation arrangement. So because we got some additional funding this year as well as last year, uh, we are able to sustain people in temporary accommodation until either they resolve their own need or we help them to resolve their need. That's very good news, but my question still goes back to the rough, rough sleepers who, you know, I mean, by, by the numbers you've given us, there's probably about 500 you've got into long-term permanent housing. That's really good. Yes. That's still, there's still, you know, over 2,000 people there. Um, so are you saying to me that essentially they will stay in, a, in temporary accommodation for as long as it takes to find them permanent Accommodation? Is that, so, is, that what, so is that the commitment? We, we, last night we had 198 rough sleepers in temporary accommodation. Mm -hmm. So that number has dropped as some people have chosen to, to leave. But where people are working with us, our commitment absolutely is to keep them in temporary accommodation until we can house them. Mm -hmm. And yes, sometimes that means it's quite expensive because we're keeping people sometimes for uh, two months sometimes a great deal more than two mm -hmm. months uh, in order to get them into housing. And my understanding is if people ring Link to Home, they get offered up to two days accommodation initially, whereas the assertive outreach is up to 30 days. Is there? Um, can you explain to me if people are coming through Link to Home rather than assertive outreach, whether they're able to get the extra 30 days? Um, so uh, the 30 days was pre-1 July. Since 1 July, we have reverted back to business as usual. But we do have a variable amount of temporary accommodation is offered by assertive outreach because they're engaging face-to-face -face yes. with the person and can assess them. For people who come in through Link to Home, uh, it's a telephone assessment, it's a short telephone assessment. They then have to call or they can come into the local office, we prefer people to call them, they will then go through a much fuller assessment than is possible on Link to Home. And then they will be allocated an amount of days according to what they need, and we do also test people to make sure that they are actually actively looking for accommodation. So we might give them five or six days, and we'll say, you've got to demonstrate to us that you've tried to go to real estate agents, you've tried to house yourself, and if they are actively pursuing housing, we will renew their temporary accommodation again. And they, they can do that by phone. And you're not making people move in and out no, of their no, temporary no, accommodation, no. which was happening previously? Yes, it, it was. Uh, and we changed that. It was happening uh, one night at a time uh, previously. We extended that. But we asked... Extended it to what? Two nights. So, but then we asked people, or two nights or until the office is open. So if it was last week, <coughs> somebody might have got five nights uh, if they came in on Friday. Um, but then they, we asked them to call before they have to pack their bags to leave for temporary accommodation so that we can work out with them where to go. And if there's a space in a specialist homelessness service, we ask them to go there. Okay. Hmm. Um, well, continuing on that theme about um, rough sleeping and homelessness... Um, Homelessness New South Wales um, welcomed the $72 million and appreciated the outcomes, but they, they were critical of how it was implemented. And if I could quote from their evidence, um, as my colleague said, one of the main issues was a lack of joined up data and referral systems, which created gaps in supporting clients. We had an overly administrative process for accessing hotels causing anxiety and uncertainty for clients and a huge amount of work for homelessness services and department staff in managing. Minister, I'm sure you would have received some of that feedback directly. Mm -hmm. um, um, what's your response to that and what's changed since? Well, well I suppose um, that goes to Ms Sharp's earlier question of, of what things you, you would do differently. I, but I'd simply say, Mr Chairman, there's, there's been no how-to guide to any of this. There isn't chapter and verse on, on uh, what you would do when a pandemic hit. We did the best that we could. Um, 
with the resources that we, we had available, our intentions were always the best, which was about housing as many people as we could. I do appreciate and acknowledge the feedback from Homelessness New South Wales. They've been a, an absolutely tremendous partner um, to work with and to seek advice from, uh, and you know, we'll always listen to that advice and try and improve practice. But just so you're aware too, um, I was having, when COVID started, weekly sector calls um, with all of the peaks, including Homelessness New South Wales um, and um, Ms Sharp as the Shadow Minister, and any of that feedback that we received, uh, we were seeking to act on as quickly as we could. Well, what, what have you done to yeah. address their concerns about it being yeah. overly administrative? And, and, you know, Homelessness New South Wales said mm. that they didn't get any additional resources to deal with this and that their staff are at risk of burnout and exhaustion. And the pandemic hasn't gone away. The work's mm. continuing. So, so what's can, been done? Can I describe what I think they are referring to? Um, when, if, if we take April the 1st as, as really when it, it reached a crisis point... We had staff, uh, we and health colleagues had staff out on the streets in Sydney 50 times a week um, during April. That meant we were getting a lot of people sleeping rough who were frightened and wanting to come in, which we welcomed because some of them wouldn't come in uh, before. So we pre-booked 350 hotel rooms in Sydney uh, to receive them. And our on-the-street staff had to ring in to our housing contact centre to get allocations of rooms. And that did take some time mm. to do. Within about 10 days, we all our staff, have, our outreach staff have iPads. Within about 10 days, we were able to give them the, the hotel allocations on their iPads. So when face-to-face -face with a rough sleeper, they could press a button and say, you are in the Holiday Inn in Potts Point can turn up there now and you will find a room for you. They will allocate your room number. And so we used technology to get over that initial bit of bureaucracy, which was unfortunate and absolutely, as the Minister said, it's something that we're learning from and we're developing a permanent IT system. Um, I, I can't comment on homelessness New South Wales staff. I, I don't know enough. Well, we'll have th that that that's that iPad and that online booking is available to, to your staff. But what about the those NGOs who are out there working with homeless people who are often on the front line wanting to get some accommodation for a, a rough sleeper they're working with? Um, that their, their evidence was very clear. There were a lot of gaps. There was, there was, it was very administrative. It was taking a lot of their time to actually identify the home, to identify a place. What, what have you done to bridge that gap? Well, in most cases, those NGO staff, I'm talking in Sydney here, which is where there are most rough sleepers, in most cases, those NGO staff are out with our staff. We do it together. Uh, there are relatively few occasions when those NGOs are out uh, on, on their own. I'm talking Sydney uh, here. So, um, but everybody can ring Link to Home uh, we put on additional staff during the COVID period, during the early COVID period, to be able to deal with what definitely was an increase in calls. And our, our waiting times were not that long during that period. Mr Chibish, we also developed a, a crisis accommodation register, and I might ask Simone if you wanted to elaborate on that work. Um, thanks, Minister. Walker, so um, there was uh, a list put together because actually what we had during the COVID period was a huge amount of hotels that came forward wanting uh, to offer opportunities uh, for us, particularly around uh, people that were either rough sleepers or leaving domestic violence. And so we were able to create a register um, and, and also channel that into one place because we also knew that providers were over overwhelmed in a lot of cases by offers of help. Uh, so that provided us a central system to be able to do that. Right. Yeah. Also, if you... If you um are a client of a specialist homeless service as opposed to temporary accommodation. Um, every specialist homeless service has a client information system that gives them information about vacancies elsewhere in the system. So what's come under pressure in a result, as a result of COVID is the interaction between link to home and the allocation of temporary accommodation and the broader specialist homeless service system and increasingly healthcare because increasingly our assertive outreach teams actually have, uh, as a member of the team, a colleague from health who are 
giving us support to better assess people's mental and physical health. So it, there is a challenge there mm. in better linking health information, specialist homeless service system client information, and information about who's in temporary accommodation and where they're leaving to. Mm. And just to add to that, that accommodation, readers to Mr Shear, which was developed with um, the PEGS in partnership. So I, I certainly acknowledge what uh, you've repeated in relation to their evidence, and I've got a very good working relationship with them, and obviously we'll, we'll seek to make any and all improvements we can to make that easier. Well, we'll go into that lack of... Um, a sort of coherent overall government service. They also um, made it clear that one of the concerns is a lack of a joined-up approach, and I'm quoting here from the evidence, a lack of joined-up approach between health, housing and justice. Um, and mm. Mr Coots, try to, you, you acknowledge that that's a challenge. Yep. Um, and and what, what that challenge has meant is that people are still falling through the cracks. What are you doing to, um, to, to join up those, those critical services? So the, the big change in the recent period is uh, including health in our outreach efforts in 53 locations around New South Wales. Um, the homelessness strategy that was um, initiated by the government before COVID identifies the key transition points that present people with a risk of homelessness coming out of institutions, including health institutions and, and mental health care. Um, and we, prison. And prison. And prison. So there's a lot of work going on to better plan for people's transition from prison, both in identifying earlier people's housing need, at least three months before they are released, when we know someone's release date, and also linking that to the, for those people who need continuing mental health supports we are now working in a different way and much more closely between justice health inside the prison system, local health districts and the additional staff the government's funded for community mental health care to better plan people's transition out of prisons. Um, we do have a, a big challenge in developing an IT platform that facilitates this different way of working. So we're working with systems that basically support a more siloed approach to all of this and what we need is a system that respecting people's privacy actually provides better information about individuals across agencies if, and, and Paul's team has um, is doing work with other agencies of government to try and initiate that. And if I could supplement the Secretary's evidence too, that we have also an inner city homelessness task force as well that yeah. comprises the uh, LHD uh, and housing services and supports including I think NEMI as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, NEMI that provide the support of transition engagement program which is that transition from temporary accommodation to uh, to more permanent supported accommodation. Penny, did you start that question? I just, I, uh, I just was wondering whether that system also picks up kids in JJ. They already have a plan, I think, for exiting. Yeah. Um, look, it, it hasn't been a strong focus in part because, uh, as the Minister said, I think um, planning there is, uh, because of the, you know, there's 191 young people in detention. I, I think we'll moment. do JJ separately. Okay. That probably is a separate round okay, um, rather than trying to deal with it here. Okay. Um, uh, homelessness New South Wales also points out that 30% um, of all their clients are Aboriginal, and that's mm. consistent yep. across the state. Yep. And they point to, to the ongoing lack of, an Aboriginal, of Aboriginal specialist services in the system, especially for homelessness services. Yep. Have you, have you provided any additional allocation to Aboriginal homelessness? I, in fact, services? announced it last week. In, uh, I was on the Central Coast and announced um, uh, more than a million dollars to supplement the Together Home initiative there. And uh, we've, we're only uh, asking for Aboriginal controlled organisations to tender for that work um, so that we can support homelessness in an area that actually has the fastest growing uh, rates of Aboriginal population anywhere in the state. But, Minister, if that's going to be limited to the Central Coast, it's a big state... 30% um, of all homeless people across the state are Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. um, you, I think, would agree with me that a program just for the Central Coast is not going to deal oh, with no, I, I certainly agree. And look, we have specialist homelessness services for Aboriginal people as well, too, that are doing tremendous work. Did you? Well, I think they're being grossly overworked, is the problem. Oh, and, uh, I think all that, homelessness services are. But, but particularly Aboriginal um, services. And that's the evidence from not just Homelessness New South Wales, it's the evidence you get if you talk to anyone in the community. Um, there are a lack of yeah. Aboriginal specialist services. So, so before Paul, who actually knows more about this than me, hops in, um, but just looking back to um, the, um, the, the reforms of 2014 to the specialist homeless service system, 
Since that time, there's been a 70% increase in the number of Aboriginal people getting a service from the Specialist Homeless Service System because one of the, <coughs> the objectives of those changes was to do precisely that, recognising that Aboriginal people on average are at higher risk of homelessness and the service system did not well mm. respond to their needs. So beyond that, there is more to do, but um, quite specifically, the government in those reforms identified that as an objective mm. and sought to partner with organisations that could build a capability to provide appropriate, culturally appropriate services to Aboriginal people. So, Mr um, Chris Trott, if you've got the data that shows 70%, sorry, before, there's been a 70% increase, can yep. you give us the data that shows the actual proportion of Aboriginal people... I don't have that off the top of my head, but I'm happy to do it on the and and Mr. 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 No, no, Mr. I'm happy to take that on notice, Mr. Shibridge, more than happy to. Um, and Mr. Um, Vivas may want to comment yeah. on the additional funding we provide. I'm glad I didn't up. skittle Mr. Vivas on the zebra crossing this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Mr. Vivas, I, I, I saw you come in, you came out of a blind spot on. Uh, I always worry when I cross I a zebra worry. crossing as well, too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, you have, uh, being have a blind spot for you. Uh, I, I, <laughs> no. I just have one big blind spot, uh, as we'd all be aware. Um, <laughs> Mr. Davis, Mr. <laughs> no, I'm very Davis. conspicuous. Um, so NRE also received additional funding, Mr. Shootridge, which is an Aboriginal uh, organisation in the inner city right. to uh, support assertive outreach, and perhaps Mr. Yeah. Vegas <coughs> may wish to comment on that, seeing as he's had a second chance in life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very grateful to the It was the pace you came out of the domain, Mr. Vegas, that surprised me. I was keen to get here. Very keen to be here. So we do fund a number of Aboriginal organisations, and if I give you the example of NRE, we are out together with Inari every week of the year, um, and they particularly work with Aboriginal people sleeping rough, and then they help see those people through, uh, as do we, on their pathway, hopefully, into long-term housing. And we also have a number of Aboriginal staff ourselves uh, who, who work on assertive outreach. But you see, Minister, it's, it's the constant refrain from your portfolio area. Um, when you ask about a statewide problem or a systemic problem, you get told about a, a, uh, a pilot project or an individual service or an example that's doing well um, or a funding outcome in the Central Coast, whereas these are statewide problems. And there never seems to be a statewide response where you say, well, we are going to have 30% um, of all homelessness services being Aboriginal-led and Aboriginal-directed because 30% of... Uh, people are homeless or Aboriginal. We never seem to have that statewide response. And that seems to be being repeated with your Central Coast announcement. Oh, the, the only reason I, I use that example, Mr Shearage, is because I made that announcement last week after representations from the Parliamentary Secretary and local member Adam Crouch and one of your Upper House colleagues as well. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the argument is quite easily made out in an area where there is a fast-growing rate of Aboriginal people and it would make sense that where there is a high proportion of Aboriginal people that you address those areas. But I acknowledge your point. Um, and uh, obviously I want to see more Aboriginal-controlled organisations uh, supporting Aboriginal people, but I also want to make sure there is no wrong door so that when people walk through any door of any organisation, they're supported regardless of uh, their ethnicity or race. But, but we'll get that data from Mr Coots Trotter yeah, on yeah. notice. Thanks, yeah. um, we, we also have a statewide Aboriginal housing office uh, which provides almost 5,000 social housing homes for Aboriginal people and means that an Aboriginal person on the priority list will get housed more quickly than a non-Aboriginal person, including our sleepers. Um, uh, Minister, you, you <coughs> said that over the course of the pandemic, uh, a 1,000 rough sleepers have been helped into accommodation at one point or another. Is that a thousand mm -hmm. distinct individuals, or is it some people washing in and washing out? I think it was higher than that. No, it's uh, yeah, dis higher. distinct it's individuals, and yeah. the number Paul, my colleague Paul Vivas used, was for the 1920 financial year. So uh, it's not quite the period of the pandemic. Well, yeah. Um, and how does that compare to the previous financial year in um, terms I'd, of numbers? I'd, I'd have to get. I'd have to take that on notice and have that figure. Well, can me. you? Can you give a sense of, has it been a substantial increase because of the, the pandemic homelessness, you know, um, work? It definitely yes. would be an increase. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, if you go from three assertive outreach um, locations to 53, uh, obviously we are going to pick up more people sleeping. Oh, right. I, I don't think there's any... Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. You've, yeah. I think that, that sort of acknowledged broadly across the sector. Um, um, given this is kind of like a, a, a homes-first strategy... 
that we've seen, you know, the housing first strategy that we've seen have enormous success in long term health, economic mm -hmm. and social outcomes in places like Finland. Um, is this now going to be government policy, a housing first strategy? Uh, well, look, it's not the first time we've actually used a housing first approach. You might recall Platform 70 from, uh, I think it was 2011 to 2013, yeah. uh, if my memory serves me right. Uh, so <coughs> it's not the first time we've, we've engaged with this policy, but certainly, Mr. Shubridge, I think that um, it's worked incredibly well so far, uh, and I'm very supportive of things that get outcomes for uh, people who are vulnerable, and, and there's certainly been some terrific outcomes that I've seen, so I'm, I'm very supportive of this approach. But I'm very grateful for the Treasurer for funding it so far. But you see... Don't we run the risk of saying, in your portfolio again, we have this great pilot program. We ran it for six to nine months during a pandemic, the Housing First strategy. It was wonderful. Look at all these great outcomes. And then at the end of the six to nine months, when the funding runs out, bang, we go back to business as usual. Um, and, and all of that learning, all of that potential benefit is lost again. Minister, can you assure us that won't be repeated here? Well, look, the reason we have a Premier's priority around rough sleeping is because we don't just have a Premier that's committed, not uh, all of government that is focused, but certainly I am very personally invested in, in all of this, and we've certainly asked for an economic evaluation to occur as a result of to get a home. I think it's fair to say, Mr Shoebridge, it's important we evaluate uh, every program, and I'm you know, sure and I would expect and I would hope that there'd be questions about uh, how the program has gone once it's been fully implemented to make sure we've done the right thing. But I personally believe that uh, we have done a very good job. The Housing First approach is working. It's something that Catherine McKernan and the, uh, the Homelessness Peaks have championed, and uh, I've been very, very keen to support it and to seek funding from Treasury, and I'm very proud of the results that we're achieving. Well, um, when you say the, the assessment, who's undertaking that assessment, and when are we going to have the data, the first data at least, on the assessment? So we... We have committed ourselves to be accountable in terms of the, the Premier's priority and that we will do a street count across the state every year. We did the first one last February. We actually acknowledged that the combination of bushfires and floods would have meant that that was an undercount. We counted 1,300 rough sleepers across the state uh, in, in, in a large number of locations, but we think that is an undercount. Uh, the next count will be in February, and we will do that every year, uh, and those results have already been published for last February. But, but what, about, what about the benefits, economic, social and health, yeah. to yeah. a thousand people yeah. um, who have been moved into housing? Um, have you got somebody... I mean, this is a, it's, been, it's almost been like a, a made-to-measure study of a Housing First strategy. Mm. Have you got somebody doing a longitudinal study of that and assessing the, the broader outcomes? So my colleague, Simone yes. Walker. Yes, so just on the Together Home, we yeah. are appointing an evaluator in October, and so they'll be looking at both the metro, regional, and also the high-needs packages, which um, Homes for New South Wales may have mentioned in their evidence where they're administering those 40 packages um, through that service. So we'll be keen to see the differences and also the similarities between... Uh, how that's been applied, knowing that in some of the regional areas in New South Wales, uh, rental properties are incredibly tight, um, and that may have an impact. So given it is October, does that mean you're going to be... A, now your intention is sometime in the next few weeks to actually appoint somebody to do an analysis of it? I mean, it does seem rather like catch-up, I would have thought. Oh, this no, would no, just, be, just, just to be if you're rolling out yeah. a program like this and it has a potential to provide such benefit... No, it's, it's a, I would it's have a, thought you would have established a, it's a great question, an assessment at the, at the beginning. It's a great question, but just to answer it directly, I mean, we haven't finished filling all of the vacancies. So once um, the program is fully rolled out, it would, would make sense then to make sure that we do a proper evaluation of, of the program once it's concluded. Did you want to add anything to that, Ms Walker? No, that's absolutely accurate. How many vacancies do you expect to fill? What's the total number? Um, so, as the Minister reported earlier, I think we're at 377. Yeah, but I wanted... Four, you four, four, 400. 400. 400. 400. Capacity is 400. 400. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about Roche figures, and um, I know that we haven't got yep. the reporting yet to June, <coughs> um, and, but I, you know, in, there's been quite a lot of data come out of other countries in mm. relation to, essentially, kids being, through various lockdown programs, being caught in families where things are not good. Um, and I'm just wondering what your expectation is in relation to the June quarter reporting and whether you expect there to be a dip, given there was around 
10 to 12 weeks, particularly where mandatory reporters, particularly schools and teachers, um, and to a lesser degree, doctors and nurses, had less eyes on kids. Yeah, you're right, Ms Sharp. I mean, um, the world experience has been that these reports fell during uh, the, um, the lockdown periods. And you're also right that um, our second, high, uh, second largest group of mandatory reporters is teachers. Um, yeah. So uh, you're right that the, the data has, uh, has fallen and increased. My understanding is that whilst the numbers for July were down compared to June, they were up on this time last year. They were. So uh, just to take that period, looking at 2019, uh, children at, uh, screened in at risk of significant harm and 2020 the same, the same measure. So um, <coughs> 2020 uh, Roche reports were up on, in January on the year before, up in February on the year before, flat in March. Yep slightly down in April, and this is the period you're talking about, yep. um, flat again compared to the year before in May, up in June, up in July, and up in August against the year before. But as the Minister said, uh, there was a, a larger number of children screened in at Roche in June than there was in July, which is probably something of a catch-up of the period when yeah. fewer children were at school. Yeah. And Ms Sharp, if I'm, I could just add, um, and it goes to the Minister's comment, that the biggest reduction, as you'd expect, was from the Department of Education and teachers in particular because yeah. children weren't being seen. Of course. Um, in of course. I, 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 I'm not trying to allocate any no, blame. No, I'm, no, trying no, get, no, no, no. I'm trying to get a handle on yeah. um, what it's actually meant for kids, um, you know, yeah. year reports. And, and so, which goes to my next question, which is that there's been some work done um, in the UK that I'm aware of that basically showed during the lockdown in the UK that the severity of injuries of small children in particular presenting to emergency departments yeah. was significantly uh, increased, um, both in the number of kids presenting um, and the severity of their injuries. And I'm just wondering if you're aware of... Ha have, have we been tracking that? And yes, if so, how? And could you give us a bit of an update about that? Yeah, no, we, we have. And my understanding is that those reports are up. Um, we uh, obviously, when it, it, as you would be aware, emergency staff are mandatory reporters yes. and they are fast-tracked if mm. they ring through to the Child Protection Helpline because obviously the circumstances are often more severe. But I do believe the presentations... Uh, so so right. just so um, reports of, of sexual abuse or serious physical abuse are allocated to our joint child protection response teams, yeah. the highly successful partnership between police, DCJ and health... And we haven't seen an increase in the proportion of children, thankfully, who have been uh, reported as experiencing significant physical abuse. And we looked at the evidence from overseas as well, and we concluded this is something we have to keep a close eye on. There's uh, strong evidence out of the US that in previous economic downturns, one of the features of... Uh, of downturns is an increase in physical abuse of children, um, but we have not yet seen <coughs> that borne out in in reports to uh, the Joint Child Protection Response Group. But that would, but would that? Are you confident that you're picking up? I, I don't, you know. Again, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just interested that we are actually picking up. You know, the emergency departments that may that might not pick that be picking that up. Do you think? We, uh, or I is think, that just generally the case? Uh, I, uh, look, I. I would be confident uh, in normal times that they would. I'd be particularly confident actually in COVID times because the volume of people turning up at emergencies have fallen. They, yes. have, become, they have become less busy places, yes, yes. Um, <coughs> giving health staff more time, I guess, to assess these things. I've just got a note here, Ms Sharp. Um, Roche reports specifically from New South Wales Health for July 2020 are 2% higher than June 2020 yep. and are 20% higher than July 2020. 19. Yeah, okay. 20% higher than July 2019. Yes. <coughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's what we will probably come back to you at a different point in terms yeah. of unpacking that. That's, that's the yeah. concern. And look, could I just <coughs> say, um, I will you know, place on record, I know the caseworkers had an incredibly difficult time trying to mm -hmm. see people when you're not allowed to see people and, and all of those things, um, but I have spoken to some caseworkers who have been very concerned just about just, you know, fearful for what's happening to kids in, in homes and, and, and um, the issues in, in terms of presentation and being able to see them. Yeah. So, 
why I ask the questions, really. Um, and just to that, sorry, if I can just jump in and feel free to stop me if, if you don't want to know this, but we, we did develop um, some practice guidelines around um, uh, visiting during that period, particularly mm -hmm. using um, uh, digital devices, so digital visits, um, to um, make sure that we could continue uh, as much face-to-face -face as we could, but also to use other platforms as well, too. And, and if I could just add, um, in addition to that, um, there was guidance around children at risk of significant harm and caseworkers where possible checking in with families before they went. But then um, after that risk assessment, if it was determined we still needed to conduct a face-to-face -face assessment, they'd use um, PPE in order to go out and uh, carry out that face-to-face -face assessment. Yeah. That is, not a that is not an easy thing to do. No, no, I um, our, our case workers are absolute troopers and no, they're, they they're, are, they're a amazing. phenomenal job. Yeah. Uh, and actually they have significantly increased the number of children, children assessed mm. in the last three months. It's uh, at this stage more than 25% above the number of children they saw in the same three months last year. So they, they are doing an extraordinary job. What's the explanation for that? Is it as a result we, of more we, Zoom we, sessions or more some productivity changes? Uh, so we have a thesis. Um, <coughs> partly uh, we think we've got past some of the issues with people's ability to use Child Story as a platform. The Minister's also indicated we're making Child Story mobile, so we think that that will improve. Uh, we have really embedded our child protection practice framework, so people really understand, I think, very clearly their roles. Uh, the role of the child... Uh, <coughs> the casework support officers and supporting caseworkers to get out and see children is proving to be really effective. Great leadership at a manager casework level and a real focus on undertaking safety and risk assessments quickly so that uh, people are able to move on where risk is low and moderate and we don't need to be working with that family. And we think all those things in combination uh, explain what's happening. Plus we are really recruiting great people. And they, over this period we've also seen the number of uh, ACAs continue to fall as well too, uh, which I know is of interest to you, Mr Shubridge, and Ms Sharp as well. And if I could just add to the caseworker vacancies, um, that's been Good, I was about to ask. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it would help if the Minister would actually provide me with the information that I ask for, which I'm sure that you have dutifully provided to his office, but that's okay. We'll, uh, you can let me I'm know not how that's I'm not going. providing you that time. No, you haven't. No. You flicked it back again. Yep. Uh, maybe, Ms Sharp, you could ask your question and then you yep. can answer it. Well, I mean, I have been seeking this information now. This is the third attempt, um, probably the fourth attempt, if you count, when I've asked some questions on notice, which is that in the last budget unit, you said that, it was going, that you were recruiting 72 new caseworkers. Yep. At a variety of meetings, it became clear that really none of them had been in place um, until earlier this year. I've, I've been seeking information um, on when they, not just were they recruited, but when they actually physically started work. And no one has been willing to prepare, to prepare that information. Well, Given, yeah. um, you know, I don't think it's an unreasonable question. And I'm happy for you to take it on notice if you're actually going to provide it to me. But, but, but what I'm asking for is when you crow in the budget last 12 months ago that you're recruiting 72 new caseworkers, and I know that there was not one new person started until after March this year, um, I want to know when they started and where they were. To, to cl for clarity, I, I wouldn't crow about caseworkers. I mean, well, but, but, that's your but, main but, announcement but, in your budget. But, uh, I, well, well you know. Ms. Ms Sharp, I think the success of a social safety net isn't actually how many people are in it, but how many people no longer need it. But, but that aside, um, there are 233, sorry, 2,333 funded caseworker yeah. positions. Um, they are all full. Uh, that's my advice. Yeah, that's, that's well, correct. We're, we're, um, we're having the deadening jargon a negative vacancy. In other words, we've got more than 2,333 caseworkers. Today. Yeah. Okay, and, and we have for the last few months the next look, and, and look, I'm happy about that. The, yeah, the sorry, point, the sorry point can she just that. answer the question? Um, I, I was just going to add, the next caseworker dashboard um, is scheduled to be released for the period up to the end of June, uh, at the end of this month. Yep. So um, that will reflect exactly what the Minister and Michael... Uh, but can I just say, Ms Sharp, your concern is a right one. Mm. And I absolutely agree with you that it is unacceptable to have a caseworker vacancy rate. And uh, my commitment is to keep that at zero. Yeah, I know. I, know. I, just, well, I, just, want to, I just want to acknowledge your, your concern because I think sure, you're right. Well, to have my it. question, well, the issue is that you've still got to figure where you've around 30% of kids who are reported at 
risk of serious harm are actually seen by a caseworker. And by what Mr Coots Trotter said, we're looking forward to figures heading nudging up towards 40%. Um, that's what I understood your... If you had a 25% increase in the number of kids being seen, that's around 37% yeah. we would expect in the next figures. Um, Depends on the growth and the number yeah. of children reported at the Rosh, yeah, of course. Okay. But, yeah. but, you know, as I said... You know, More children are being seen. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. right. And 70 new case, 72 new caseworkers is very... Um, is, was a good announcement and welcomed by all. My concern is that the budget pressures on the department mean that the easiest way that you can meet some of your savings targets is not to fill those, and I don't no, understand Not why while I'm took, the Minister. Well, no. why did it take over nine months for you to fill those positions? Well, that's an operational question, but well, I've I'm made it clear you. that I want a zero vacancy rate. Mm -hmm. I'm sure yeah. uh, Ms Sharp, it wouldn't matter whether it was me in this role or you in this role or anyone else in this role. I'm not that arguing the about the vacancy rate. I'm asking, I'm asking <coughs> about 72 funded <coughs> that's positions what it relates that, weren't, to. that weren't filled for well, over nine said, months. You said it was an operational issue, so maybe yes. Mr Coots Trotto can... Uh, look, I'm happy to take more detail on notice, but um, that, that we had, and we have to continue to, to, to work on this, but uh, the challenge, we had locational challenges in filling roles, yeah. so um, we would find ourselves with... Um, far West, how do you Yeah, Far West, yeah. Hunter, New England, um, sometimes Mid-North Coast, um, sometimes the Joint Child Protection Response Team, because what we want there are experienced caseworkers. Um, so we've we've had to um, really hone in on the factors that are relevant in particular locations, or in the case of the Joint Child Protection Response Team, um, the, the kind of requirements for the work. And so that was a challenge for us in getting um, the 72 roles filled as quickly as we would like there. Uh, fully filled now, as I say, overfilled across the system, and um, the, the minister quite literally asks us about it every week. Um, it's um, an extraordinarily regular and powerful form of accountability. Consider that added to the added to the list yeah. mm. um, to help you with that, minister. Oh, I appreciate your help. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, uh, I wanted to ask about you, you sort of, um, Mr. Check talked a little bit about this, the issue of um, the digital divide, which really opened up during COVID, and the issue of uh, kids in out of home care, particularly, uh, or even um, kids within, you know, getting other family and, and services not having, you know not having access to devices. How many devices did the department end up actually giving out? 893. And, you, and my understanding is you had over 6,000 applications. A lot of them were duplicate applications. Um, How many of those were duplicate applications? I don't know the answer to that question. Not 5,107. I won't think so. <laughs> I'm, right. I'm happy to provide that at a later date because yep. we do have the details. So not only did we have um, multiple agencies putting in for individual families, but some agencies putting in multiple times for the same. I just want to make sure, sure that but, I'm right but on that Let's be clear, the, the demand right. massively overwhelmed supply. Uh, I think it was, I think, I think that's a fair characterisation. It was an open call. It was an absolute open call um, for people. What we know is that the um, Department of Education was had 10,000 devices that they were um, handing out, prioritising uh, kids who were in regional areas and also uh, year 10, 11 and 12, so we had to balance with yeah, that Yeah, that's well. great, but there was no carve-out specifically for kids in out-of-home care. But we also know that um, out-of-home care providers, including DCJ, were also providing devices to so children. We did people. have criteria, though, which related no, to... No, I'm not asking. I want well, to know well, how many... I want to know... Well, she was trying to answer your question. No, no, no. I, I, I'm happy to seek the clarity from... from the well, I'm trying to understand how many kids in out-of-home care ended up with a device through this process? So there, we'll have to take it on notice, but there were a number of ways in which children in care would be equipped with devices. Firstly, the, for those in public schooling, the Department of Education itself. Secondly, the mechanism you were asking about. Thirdly, both DCJ and non-government care providers bought devices. So between March and August, we spent $1.7 million on additional educational supports which were not just devices, it also includes tutoring and other, other educational supports. And we know that our non-government partners have done the same, but I wasn't able to get a number for you, got anticipated the question, but we will try and answer it on notice. 
And I'd just simply also add to that that we're uh, working with the Department of Customer Service to try and make this an ongoing feature so that where we can repurpose devices yeah. for children that need them, that we will. I think that's a, a very So the devices use. that you provided were repurposed from elsewhere? or were Yeah, they well, they're, they're often donated. They're repurposed yeah. from elsewhere. There was, I think... I think well, for the 800... Did you get some from transport? 90-odd. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. But for the devices that we bought ourselves for children in DCJ care or our non-government partners bought, they, they bought devices as need be, and particularly <coughs> network connections. And yeah, if, don't you? Need to, well, I mean, data is the big issue. I mean, data I know is, that data is the, the big community, issue. And yeah. again, I'm not telling you. All of the community organisations say it might be fine. Mum might have one phone in the house, but she might be doing TAFE and a whole range of other things. Yeah. The idea the kids were doing schooling yeah. from home with one device. Yeah, the hardware is not really the issue. And yeah. I'm sure you'd recall the conversations, Ms Sharp, because I believe you or your staff member were on the calls when we were having these conversations with the um, with the sector more broadly. Yeah, that's right. But my, my question ultimately is if we've only been able to get about 800 devices out, I mean, there, there's a bigger question here that COVID's really led to. We've, people have been talking about the digital divide for quite a long time. We know that kids in out-of-home care um, particularly move around a lot. Um, and, you know, I'm just wondering whether, you know, upon your reflections of things that we might do differently, yep. that, that actually having a digital strategy to close that gap for kids in out-of-home care would be seen as a good thing. And I, I'm not aware of, I'll be correct if I'm wrong, but I'm not aware of other states doing anything similar like this, but, but what, what we are... Well, my understanding is that Victoria... Well, let, let him add... But, but my, let my let understanding him. is, uh, Ms Sharp, that we, we were focusing on uh, kids where there was a service that was provided but, but for COVID were not going to be able to get a service so that we rolled them out as a priority. Vulnerable children 0 to 5, um, people in rural and remote areas were the ones that were given priority. And my understanding, though, is the devices weren't rolled out until about July, is that right? Uh, I... Have to ask I can get the dates on that. So I think so the kids are off school from March, but no devices actually went out till after, minus, at least after I June. I think you're part of the conversations with that as part of the sector, Ms. Sharp, so you'd be aware when we were talking about it. Well, I'm just asking you to confirm that. Well, we've taken it on those. Yeah. Could I just make a further comment about children in out of home care? Very early on in the lockdown period where schools were closed, uh, between Ms. Walker and I, we made a decision to ask all DCJ caseworkers and NGA caseworkers to contact carers to ask about what they needed in order to homeschool children in out-of-home care. Now, that can include provision of a, a laptop, uh, network. Um, we bought many a dongle from memory. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, very popular, and, the dongles. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and also tutoring where we were able to access it um, early on. And... That is in part reflected in the figures that the Secretary um, just described, and it's a significant increase in expenditure from the year before. And I know myself, because I had to approve many of them, um, it was new laptops and, like I said, some other school supplies or tutoring. Um, the other thing which I think is important to note is that many children in care already had a laptop or had network connections. So, it wasn't a case that all children in out of home care did not have access to those devices. No, no, no. I, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting. No, no, no. I just minute. wanted to make the point. Yeah. I, w I would say the the bigger issue for us was the connectivity or the network, um, particularly depending on where, where people live. lived. Mm. So there were a number of processes underway, but we're, I'm happy for us to not let like that. Yeah, that's great. Um, which actually goes to my next question, which was, um, what additional financial support for carers did you provide for foster carers or kinship carers did you provide during uh, so we have the highest average payment for foster carers um, of any state, mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah. Yep. Highest um, fortnightly base rate pay. And, and obviously... Which I, is? I, it depends on the category of care. I know, uh, I know, yeah. I know. So, yeah. so, yes, um, I know. Yep, so the base rate is 500. And yeah. The base rate is about... The, the, about the allowances are age-based. Um, yeah, and yeah and there's categories. Speak, they, yeah, sorry, yeah, right. I shouldn't have asked. I know that that's a complicated... It is. It is. It is. It's a table. It's a terrible table. It is a terrible table. There's three categories. Anyway, based on age. But... Uh, I'd also say, look, I think you probably agree with this, that it's also about having good care plans uh, and good leaving care plans. Um, so what is actually in the best interest of the child, what do they actually need, and how do we support them? What's the focus on that child and that family? I didn't answer my question, though. Um, so are you saying that beyond the normal pay that carers got, that there was no additional financial support provided to carers during COVID? Oh, I don't have anything to add to my previous answer. That would be the case. You're aware that Victoria, South Australia and West Australia and the ACT provided one-off payments to carers? I'm aware of that. But we did not? I have nothing to add to my previous answer. Well, yes or no, Minister? I think I've answered your question. 
you've got to be joking. Mr Coots Trotter, was there any additional funding allocation given to um, foster carers as an additional supplement during the COVID pandemic? I don't think I can improve on the minister's no. answer. No, look, the, the, oh, seriously, just I say no. No, no, so the, 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 improve on his answer, though. The, um, uh, the, the, I think he's about to answer it. So, so um, the, the, the payments to directly to carers didn't change, but there was capacity both uh, in DCJ-supported care places and non-government-supported care places uh, to provide additional brokerage contingency for particular needs that people have. That's, that's usually the case, but within COVID, we sent the message very clearly to our own staff and also to non-government organisations that there was greater scope to make more of those uh, crisis payments as required. And from memory, I think there was about three or $400,000 in those payments that were made by non-government organisations. And I don't have the figure for, for DCJ supported care. So maybe and is that and, and, and would you be able to take that on notice though in terms of how, how much would that would normally be the case or whether there was an there was additional Yeah. yeah. Sure. I'm trying to yeah. ascertain whether there was a jump. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry. Okay. Um, Minister, going to um, juvenile justice and youth justice. I think you indicated there were just under 200 children in Yeah, the 191, Mr. Richards, um, it's uh, I think the lowest uh, in about 10 years. It's, yeah. I, I have a piece of additional good news hot off the press this morning. It's 187. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I defer to Ms. Chick. 187 as of mm. um, very early this morning. Mm. And has some of that been because of active, active efforts during the pandemic to reduce numbers in detention? Or is it just other... It, it, other measures? It's a combination of factors. I'm aware that the ALS Aboriginal Legal Service in particular made a, a number of applications for bail of Aboriginal children in detention centres and many of those were successful. Uh, we haven't had as many children who have um, had final orders, if you like, made in respect of their criminal charges. The remand rate has um, hovered about 50% released inside 24 hours, which you might remember from estimates is fairly consistent. Um, but we, if you look at um, the period March to September last year in custody, it was on average 253. And the average for March to September is 217, noting the figure, daily figure today is much lower. All right, um, Ms Jack, you've obviously come with a bunch of data on this. So if there's 187 children in detention, how many of those children are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? Uh, it's about 50%, Mr Shubridge. I haven't, I haven't got the actual number with me on that measure. We'll take that on notice yeah. then, Mr Shubridge. Um, and what proportion of those children are on remand? Remand... Uh, Ge remand generally hovers at about half. Yeah, it's about 52%. Um, I do have that with me. Um, we can take it on notice. Yeah, we can take it on notice. Well, if you've got it there with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, 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 of course, of course. Yep, if you just... Bear with me for one sec, I'll get it. The pattern we saw in adult corrections we saw in youth justice as well. So there was a fall in the bail refused rate, or rather an increase in um, yeah. bail granted. Um, but uh, there was quite a marked fall in the uh, population of young people who were sentenced as well, which could just be a factor of the yeah. time expiring. I, I don't have that, Mr Shearer, <coughs> so right. we could take that on notice. We'll and provide could that. you give the um, proportion on remand for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal? Absolutely. Of course. Yeah. Um, Minister, the, the current policy for visits is that all family and social visits yeah. to youth justice centres are, are, remain suspended. As it is for corrections as well. Yeah, as it is for corrections. Um, my office, and I'm sure your office, yeah. has received multiple, multiple representations um, asking for that policy to be reviewed and to allow children to see their parents and to see their carers and to see their siblings. Um, what's the current status? Uh, unchanged, but can I just make the observation that this also works both ways. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of instances where children were anticipating a visit from their parents that never showed but they're now able to see those parents, particularly because of the long distances that uh, involve travelling to some of our more regional facilities, uh, via a device. So whilst I appreciate your question, I know it's coming from a very good place, 
the kids are digital natives. A lot of these kids um, like using devices. And whilst I know, and I'm not saying for a second, that that should replace contact with a parent, um, there is an upside to this, and it's not all entirely um, downsided. Well, I don't think that compares to getting a hug from your mum. So um, oh, I, when, I, I'm, when, I'm when more kids in detention be um, able to get a hug from their mum? So we are working with our colleagues in Corrections and New South Wales Health to plan for a resumption of social visits. Um, we don't have a timeline on that yet, and I, I do appreciate the, the costs associated with suspending social visits, but the fact that we've uh, had one, one adult uh, detainee test positive for COVID and no young people and no other adults test positive for COVID is uh, in part evidence of the effectiveness of the decisions that people took very quickly. Um, so they've come at a cost, but they have delivered an enormous benefit. But the time is right to plan for a stage return of social visits. Well, well, well given we've had no identified community transmission now for yep. many days, yep. and in parts of regional New South Wales it's been months yep. um, of no community transmission, yep. many of these facilities are in regional New South Wales. Um, you say you're beginning planning for we are planning. home visits. We are well, planning. Well, have you got scheduled meetings with health where you're going to sit down and work out are there a set of criteria that need to be met? Before? So co colleagues in operational leaders in youth justice and corrections are having those discussions. Well, in Melbourne, we're seeing um, clear markers set out for when yeah. lockdowns will be ended, when yeah. um, restrictions will be lifted. So, What are the markers... What can we look to to say, well, OK, that's the point at which kids in detention will be able so to have visits? So agencies will need to provide advice to relevant ministers, and then I would think it would go through a cabinet or a subcommittee of cabinet that manages the crisis subcommittee that manages the, um, the stance, the arrangements for um, public health orders and uh, related protocols. So it would go up. It, ministers have to sign off on it, and then a subcommittee of the cabinet yep. would need to endorse it. But it's got to get to the minister, Mr. Yeah. Strutter. So what's the process that you've got in place to to get that to the minister? Uh, advice through myself and Simone Check to Minister Ward in respect of youth justice, and advice through me and Peter Severin to. Minister Roberts, um, time frame I could take on notice and provide and, to the committee. And if I could just add, there are weekly meetings between the executive within Youth Justice, New South Wales Health and Corrective Services, and this is a standing agenda item. As mm. both the Minister and the Secretary mentioned, it, it is something we're working towards. Timeline has a question mark on it, but my hope is that we'll be able to put something to the Minister, I'm hoping by the end of this month at the latest. So, Ms Checker, are you in any of those meetings? I'm not, but the Executive Director who, of, reports, to um, you. who reports to me of Youth Justice is in those meetings, along with Peter Severin and his staff, and colleagues from mm -hmm. Health, where we're taking our advice from. And what's the advice you've received from your Executive Director about Health's position on uh, visits to Youth Justice Centres? The, as you'd expect, the, the health advice changes as, as the pandemic you, you is hope unfolding. So. Um, the most recent advice is that we can plan for a gradual uh, uh, resumption of face-to-face -face assessments. Oh, sorry, not face-to-face -face assessments, face-to-face -face visits in detention centres. And um, I'm awaiting further advice from the Executive Director on, of Youth Justice on that plan. Minister, given that you've now heard that health said that that planning can happen, are you going to make this a priority to, to ensure that um, um, as soon as safe, as soon as safe, home visit, um, parent visits, um, sibling visits can be reinstated in youth justice? Oh, absolutely, Mr Shoebridge. Uh, you're right to ask the question. I um, would like to see them resume as soon as possible, but I'd also like to um, canvas the possibility of actually continuing the option of oh, using yeah. digital yeah, devices absolutely. as well, because I think that yeah. uh, for children that have missed out on visits, as I mentioned earlier, it'd be good to be able to continue that, uh, or noting, though, uh, that nothing can, can, um, uh, can replace human contact. But, well, but you, say, you say canvas an option. Can we just accept going forward, that that will always remain part of the contact arrangements um, uh, and that kind of online connection? Why, why, why do we see it as a, an alternative? Why For the very point that you made earlier, that obviously nothing can replace human contact, but uh, I, I, would, I would say yes to that. 
there, there was a survey of two, nearly two and a half thousand family members and um, adults in, uh, in corrections about their experience of using um, video, video links of one kind or another to maintain social contact. 85% of people responding to that survey said that they found it um, really, really helpful and they wanted it to continue. And the best examples of that are people being able to read to their children at bedtime. Oh, Mr. Kutstrada, yeah, I think no, I, uh, both I, in, in I, both I, systems, both the adult system yeah. and the juvenile system, yeah. every, every report I've had is yeah. that that kind of online connections yeah. is extremely valuable. They can see the family dog, they can look around the child's and, bedroom. And you're also having, yeah. a, you're having a connection in a space that isn't in a fluorescent lit visitor yeah. centre mm. with plastic chairs and a broken you're coke machine. Strip searched on the way in. Um, yeah. And you're not being strip searched. So no. the, um, there's, there's enormous benefits to that. So do yeah. I understand it, it'll be your advice, Mr. Kutstrada, that, it, it would, that, that that should remain in both systems going forward? Uh, that would be my personal advice, yes, absolutely. And um, have you had any discussions, Minister or Mr Kutstrotter, with Commissioner Severin about... The yes, that would be... I, I have, and that would be Commissioner Severin's advice as well. Can I just update an earlier answer, Mr Shoebridge, just in relation to your question about Aboriginal children? Um, I'm advised that there are 72 Aboriginal young people in custody today at 38%. 38%? Mm. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a significant reduction. Yeah, it is. Um, do, have you had any... Ex I mean, which I've, I've got to say, I, I celebrate. In fact, all of those numbers are to be celebrated. Yes, the, I agree. Um, um, Whilst, you know, any child in detention is one too many, that the significant reduction is, is a meaningful achievement. And look, there's a number um, of programs that you'd be aware of, like um, My Journey, My Life, there's uh, Love Bites and a whole range of other programs that we run in our youth detention centres, uh, yarning circles that um, are having profound impact, but also having Aboriginal elders inside our facilities, which I've seen firsthand. And I think that our youth justice teams are very, very conscious of keeping kids connected to culture, and I think they do a great job. Mm. Um, is it, though, the situation that you expect those numbers to lift again once the criminal justice system gets back to its uh, usual production levels? No, I hope not. I hope not. Well, you say you hope not, but what's the... Well, what's I mean, the, I, don't have a, I, don't, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pleased, like you are, that the numbers are where they are. And, you know, my view has always been that we need to continue to work hard <coughs> um, to invest in uh, evidence-based targeted early intervention. And wherever that can happen, through programs like Youth on Track, which have been um, successful, um, working with our PCYCs and our police, the bail assistance line, uh, which has been uh, very successful, a place to go. Mm -hmm. uh, these are programs that um, have changed lives. They've diverted children's behaviour early, and um, I'm very proud of them. But, Mr. Kutstrada, what's the what's the what's the assessment? What's the planning going forward? Uh, so, the general view of the agency would be, or rather, um, Boxer, um, who kind of uh, hold um, hold the, the responsibility for these kind of model these, these models and the, the estimations that come from them. Um, there has been a large and sustained fall in the number of young people coming into detention, an increase in the number of young people who were successfully diverted from, attention, from detention, and we would expect that that trend is able to be maintained. Um, we do not expect that the current um, fall, significant fall in the adult prison population will be maintained. We think that that will creep up again over time. Um, but they are, mod they are models only. Um, they, we, we have to have some forward view in, in order to plan for um, uh, improvements and changes to the, the system. But um, we, we think in youth justice there is a, a, sustain a sustainable reduction there. And the orders for young people in the community have worked really well. Yeah. Restorative justice programs, it's, um, it's very heartening, and I'm, I'm sure that everyone would agree that's the direction we want to see it continue. Mm -hmm. um, moving to another issue, Minister. Um, we had evidence from, um, uh, from a number of providers of um, food services, um, respite care services, um, including um, from St Francis of Assisi, who are providing amongst other things, a food bank service out in Western Sydney. Mm -hmm. They said that um, during the pandemic period, uh, referrals, and I'll quote, during this period alone, referrals for our food bank service increased 296%, with our capacity to increase delivery of around 155%. So we know there's a lot of unmet need in our community. 
Um, that evidence was repeated from a number of providers, this massive surge yeah. um, of people needing food. Um, uh, will you undertake to provide some direct funding to those services, Addison Road, St Francis, those services that are providing food? Well, you mentioned Addison Road. Uh, they actually were able to work closely with, was it Oz Harvest? Yes. With Oz Harvest. Um, and that was always the intention, was to provide funding to uh, Oz Harvest and Food Bank uh, and then to work with... Um, food providers across the state so that we could use their networks to get uh, food and supports to where people needed it? Well, um, uh, Ms Barbero from Addison Road made it very clear that um, she was paying, paying for the food being provided by Food Bank, um, that there was um, limited, if any, direct funding coming to Addison Road from the state government despite a, specific, a, a, a direct request. Um, um, I don't know if you've reviewed Ms Barbero's evidence, but I'd urge you to. Because well, I, I her know, evidence was yeah. in stark contradistinction to the rosy picture you've just presented. Oh, look, I, I, I don't want to be under any um, misapprehensions. Obviously, there was $10 million allocated. We had $10 million to invest in food supports, and um, you know, we, we made sure it went as far as possible. Did you have anything? And there's support? an additional $8.3 million... Already in the budget. Uh, it, ...identified in September, as yeah. you say, Minister, yeah. through to the end of this financial year. Yeah. Um, look, I did read um, the, the evidence from the hearing and I did ask questions of colleagues to just understand the thinking behind uh, the decision to engage with Food Bank and Oz Harvest. And, of course, um, food, food Bank is... Uh, the, the, the reason the money went to Food Bank, um, which in turn, as you know, delivers through food through um, non-government organisations, is just the, uh, what they provide, essentially, is a logistics system. Um, and it, it was the judgment of people who understood the system that that's the best place to put the money to get the biggest bang for buck. But, uh, I mean, I, I read the evidence, so I acknowledge that, so we've asked some further questions about what well, more could be done in the work between Food Bank and the, um, you know, civil society organisations it works with. And I'm sure you'd be aware, Mr Chair, which is, there's a, an awful amount of philanthropic contributions. I was with uh, Second Bite yesterday with uh, the member uh, for Penrith, Stuart Ayres, or um, Food Chair down in Albury, Wodonga, um, with uh, Justin Clancy, which I visited. Uh, there is also a huge community contribution. I saw this during the bushfires in my own electorate, um, where people do come forward in addition to what the government has provided. No, but... but um, Addison Road in particular said many of their ongoing donors, the, 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 the restaurants, the, um, the supermarkets, um, have had to restrict what they, they're able to give or cease giving to Addison Road because of the impacts, the business impacts on the pandemic. In fact, that pool of available support has actually shrunk during the pandemic. Are you aware of that? Well, well what, what I'll, I'll do is I'll undertake to review the evidence that you um, cited then and uh, full credit to... Uh, the local member, Joe Halen, Ms Sharp uh, and uh, Jenny Leong, who I know have also raised these issues with me, as have you. Um, so I will, I will review the evidence. Right. So can I just give you just some stark figures, though, Addison Road in particular. They have received some funding for their food support from the state government, but the funding came from the EPA, and it was $26,000 to prevent food wastage. And they've used all of that money to provide food for people who don't have food. Minister... Don't you find it somewhat odd, if I could describe it, um, that in a pandemic that the food aid is coming from the EPA for Addison Road? I, I don't think people mind what agency well, the support you, comes from. Well, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think people who are receiving that aid would actually care, Mr Shoebridge. I think they just are concerned about the support that they need. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Um, and I'd just simply say that I think Addison Road, um, from all reports to the local members, does a great job. Um, I, as I've outlined to you, I had uh, the money that I received from the Treasury. We try to do the greatest good for the greatest number um, and uh, we'll continue to do that. But you'll review the evidence of oh, no, not absolutely. just Addison no, no, Road, no. but also St Francis yep. to see what, if any, direct assistance can be provided to, to those two organisations. And happy to have a further conversation with you once I've done that. Um, in terms of unmet need, one of the categories of, of largest unmet need are, well, there's two. There's people on refugee um, visas who have no federal assistance... Um, and minimal state assistance. Um, um, are you looking to provide an expanded service to people on refugee um, um, visas 
given, I'll give you just one example, the evidence we had that there were massively overcrowded housing that they were living in, um, and that massively overcrowded housing was producing both health and interpersonal violence risks. Yeah, yeah. as I've just been rightly reminded, although I know that um, my friend and colleague, Minister Lee, worked very hard to secure $6 million through uh, his agency to support um, refugees and those that needed support. He did a great job in order to provide it. Well, but the evidence we had was that there were people, families, yeah. multiple families living in single dwellings, mm. in massively overcrowded houses, which is not only a health risk in a pandemic, but also creates significant risk of interpersonal violence um, because of the massive overcrowding. Um, the $6 million had not addressed that, wasn't going anywhere near addressing that. Is, any, is your portfolio looking to provide some additional assistance? Uh, look, not at this point because uh, I'm charged with looking after the citizens of the state um, and uh, that's what we're seeking to do and uh, I've already outlined the ways in which we're doing that in addition to the extra support that Minister Lee has secured as the Multiculturalism Minister. But there are a bunch of kids, a bunch of kids, thousands of kids, and estimate some 5,000 kids living in, in families um, who, who have refugee status, 5,000 kids in this state. Are you saying that because they're not citizens, you're not providing any services to them. Uh, look, I have to. I obviously have, obviously have to, to to fix my priorities on the responsibilities that I have. Obviously, I don't want to see any child uh, living in any disadvantaged circumstance. Um, obviously, I don't want that. You don't want that. No one in this room wants but that. But don't, well, don't let him finish. But, but I think we're doing the greatest good uh, at a very difficult time, Mr. Shoebridge, which has been a, a great challenge for everybody. Uh, and as I say, I've said it once already. There, there is no how-to guide for any of this. But given the supports that we've provided, I think that we've um, gone a long way to meeting a lot of that disadvantage. Have we met everybody's disadvantage uh, and uh, challenge? No, um, but we're doing the very best we can. Well, 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 Minister, you say greatest good, but concepts even like, you know, Pareto optimal, optimal funding, you know, those most in mm. need mm. should surely be receiving the first, the, the, the first support. And it's hard to imagine people more in need than the 5,000 refugee kids in the state who are living in grossly overcrowded housing, if they've got a house, have no federal support, uh, are literally um, uh, relying upon um, food banks so they don't starve. You, you say the greatest need. Why aren't they on your radar? Uh, well, it's not that they're not on my radar. As I mentioned, I've had conversations with Minister Lee about that, and I've already outlined what the government's provided. Um, can I ask for a two-minute adjournment, please? Yep. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Well, in fact, why don't, why don't we say... Um, un until ten past, so everyone can go up and stretch their legs. Is that okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll hand over now. to um, the Honourable Penny Shaw. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, I, I, want to, I want to ask about the helpline and congestion and outages during the COVID period. Mm. Um, there were some notes I saw on the website um, at various points um, around coronavirus, and I'm just trying to get a sense of how many outages there were, how long they were for, what the issue was. All, all good questions I'll, I'll ask. Uh, you may, I'm OK if you take them on notice, but yeah, they were actually on your coronavirus page, so I just didn't were, know whether yeah. it was... It worried me that it was quite longer than just sort of, you know... It was a, a long period. Long. Yeah, but I'll, but I'll take those on notice, Michelle, and get back to you. OK. Um, yeah, can you just... Will you be able to tell me just how many outages they were? I'm obviously interested... I mean... Congestion's normally not a problem for the helpline. Um, no, and the, the major achievement for the helpline team was it, well, that they um, stopped coming into a call centre because that's a high-risk environment. They work from home, yeah. and they've managed to increase their productivity while doing that. Uh, just an extraordinary achievement. Um, and we've seen a very significant increase in the proportion of mandatory reporters using e the e-reporting tool. That's yeah. now a really popular way of reporting to the helpline. Um, are you doing some analysis of that in terms of the quality of the information that yeah, you've provided? Yeah, we are. We are. Um, no, that, that, that's, that's a proper concern because it becomes a less efficient way of reporting if... You then have to find the reporter and get back onto them and, and yeah. fill out the picture. Yeah. Um, so, no, we're, we're having a look at that. We are. And um, just to add, it's still today about 90% of our staff at the Child Protection Helpline are working remotely, which is yeah. fantastic. And, and do you expect that to... I mean, how do you... What, is it, what do you think that's going to look like in, you know... The, 
post-COVID yeah. world, yeah. Will, will people be able to do that? I'm assuming this yeah. stuff have quite liked it. A- absolutely, yeah. So um, it'll be a balance, so it's it won't be 90-10, yeah. yeah. um, yeah. and I'm not sure what the ratio will be, but certainly... <laughs> It'll be a bit of both. Um, and there's sort of that flexibility for people to sort of do yeah, three days yeah, on and then yeah. three days, two at and, home. And the feedback um, from staff surveys at the helpline and some of our other uh, locations, offices, has been that staff in the main, um, through flexible working, i.e. working from home, um, have a much, much better work-life balance and they can, you know, just run the errand or... You know, duck out. Not to spend an hour on the train. Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. So I, I think it will be a balance. I think the the challenge for us, while we've transitioned to virtual means for team meetings, supervision, etc., is that some people quite rightly still want that face to face, either meeting with their supervisor or with their team. So it's getting a bit of a balance of of those two things. But it, you know, it's. The pandemic has certainly had a few silver linings, mm. particularly around uh, flexible work practices. Uh, and we have been asked to um, plan for and encourage for those people who want to return to office locations, mm. and they're the people who've been working remotely. Mm. Um, 50% of our staff or more have been at their usual place of work through the pandemic because they, they can't do the work from anywhere mm. else. But we're we're beginning to encourage those people um, who want to to return to the office, um, but the workplace is never going to look quite the same. Mm. Yeah, great. And in some really positive ways, people with disability, particularly yes. in our organisation, have uh, provided the most positive feedback about this period because, for the first time, the organisation has been forced to be purposefully inclusive. As it should Reasonable be. adjustments as have actually been be. made. Yes. yes. <laughs> that's right. As, as, as yeah, it should be. That's, yeah, a, that's yeah, exactly the same that. feedback I've had. Mm. Um, which, uh, I don't think I've got very much time, have I? You have 14 minutes and 54 seconds. Do you want to go You do. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> well, I'm not going to keep you longer <laughs> than you need to. I did actually want to ask some questions about disability. Um, is that right? I don't, I don't think, think I had that right. long. I don't think, no, I don't think, I don't think you've been I'm too relaxed, generous. I think you've been too generous. I'm relaxed. I'm relaxed. It's all right. Um, I wanted to... Uh, I'm not really... I mean, as you know, during yeah, the COVID issue, the COVID pandemic, particularly at the beginning, there were a huge amount of issues for people with disability, and I, you know, I wrote to you about many of them. Um, and I mean, by general reflection, um, while much of this is, is in the purview of, of the NDIS... <coughs> that there remain concerns ten, about... Um, ten, sorry, they're just negotiating time. Ten, ten, ten. Okay, yeah. Okay, ten, ten, ten. it's all right. Yeah. Um, uh, I suppose what I'm wanting... What, what, the question that I'm, that I'm trying to ask is... Um, and it, it's really about your role at the federal level um, with the Ministerial Council, yeah. is, is what reflection is going on in relation to the response to the pandemic for people with disability? Um, what... Do you, th- you know, and I noticed in the budget last night that the Quality Assurance Agency got more money, which is very welcome. Um, but, but I'm really trying to understand. I had everyone had many concerns. Everyone was learning as we go through. I accept that everyone is actually trying to do their best, but I do feel that people with disability except, um, really were left out of the equation very early and really had to fight to actually get some very specific issues around support workers and all of those things dealt with. Can you just provide me an update about where the national the national ministerial council is yeah. on that, and, and what reflection is going on in relation to that? No, thank you for, for the question. Um, look, uh, there are a number of things that that happened. Firstly, um, the, Dis- the disability reform council, which is the the council of ministers, yeah, was sorry, meeting I up monthly. The name. No, no, I wasn't yeah. having a go. I was just, just <laughs> making the observation. Yeah. Uh, and um, <clears throat> there were a number of things that um, I took up to that council. Uh, and sought clarification and support on, and I'm sure um, that'd be of interest to you, certainly getting people out of hospitals into disability accommodation, support of disability accommodation was was critical. Um, Making sure there was sufficient PPE, and I raised that continuously um, with Minister Robert and the the Commonwealth Government for disability support workers, and I'm sure you would have heard the same thing. In fact, you wrote to me about that very issue. Um, We also raised... um, uh, workforce continuity and having supports in place so that um, services could continue to provide those supports that were absolutely critical. And look, just by way 
of reflection and tell me if you don't want this information, but in our system, in, with NDIS participants, um, there were 10 participants that um, uh, were confirmed as having COVID-19 with one active case in addition to that right now that I think was detected at the end of last week. Yeah. Uh, and there were 10 staff and two people uh, in the NDIS so in When New you South say Wales. our system, you just mean across New South Wales. You're not, in, talk, you're not talking about our Yeah, yeah, in New South Wales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, they're in the NDIS. And, and, two, yep. and two, two people tragically passed away as a result yep. of COVID. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what... Is there... Is there a process? I mean, you know, the disability sector has been very, um, very active on, on this issue, and you know, I mean, I think they've been really quite angry about it. Um, is the through the through the uh, ministerial, you call it now, disability reform council, yeah, yeah. is there is there a process of reflection around um, not so much what happened then, but preparation for the future? Because there was a big gap between people raising the flag um, around the um, contagion issues and PPE and support workers before there was actually action, in my view. Not your issue, federal issue, but I'm just wanting to know whether there's, there's actually going to be some federal assessment. Um, in no, my understanding is the Quality and Safeguards Council. Commission are, are doing that work. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah. Um, I, you know, I think it's all of our issues. I mean, I think it's important that that is done. And um, my understanding is that they are doing that uh, as part of what's happened, but also um, making sure that we're better prepared into the future um, for everything from uh, the critical supports that are necessary immediately, but also uh, scenario planning around things like COVID in group homes. Yeah, that's good. Um, I've got one last question, which is actually, you might need to take it on notice. I'm wanting, wanting to know how many young people in foster and kinship care um, aged out during the COVID period. Uh, I'd have to take that on notice, but... No, no, I had it too, sorry. I shouldn't have reached the age of 18. Yes. Um, COVID period, I'm not sure. The 1920 financial year, 850 children, well, young people, turned 18 and left care. I mean, the period I'm talking about, I suppose, is that so that that, that, yeah, lockdown, no, no, that very I, difficult I, lockdown. So I don't know whether yeah. you would say March no. or June, I, whatever you like. If you could provide that, no, sure. Uh, very I do have the number from April to August, but it's yeah. all exits during that time. Yeah. So that's one thousand one hundred and eight. But we would have to break it down to. But that includes like children being restored to families. Yeah. And so like, we yeah. can break okay. it down to um, number of children who've aged out during. The I mean, can I just say I've <clears throat> done some meetings with with kids um, in care recently and. Uh, I heard some pretty disturbing stories about those turning 18, had been in residential facilities and then essentially um, having no, not really any planning for what was going to happen to them. They were never actually homeless, but one person had been living happily at a residential facility for quite a long time, for you know, 18 months or so, um, and he turned 18 and they said, right, we're putting you in a caravan park, and he was there for four months. Mm. He's only recently been given long-term housing. This is on the north coast. Um, and it just worried me, you know, particularly given COVID and all of those issues, that why the, what extra position, you know, what was being done to sort of say, well, why don't you just stay here for an extra couple of months until we get you something permanently? It worried. That was. I mean, it's only one example, but yeah. it concerned me enough to, to I be don't asking know if you, about it. I don't now. know if you're prepared to, but I'd love to know more about that particular case. But my advice to well, my direction to the agency was be as flexible as you can. Um, there are obviously aftercare uh, support payments. Um, for certain young people, there's also education supplements for kids that are continuing their, their studies up to the age of 24. We can provide supports up to the age of 25, but I'd love to, if, if you're able to, um, connect me with that information so I can actually investigate it. There was, the there, person, was yeah. there was flexibility. Absolute instruction to have flexibility. Instruction to our non-government partners to say, if a young person needs to stay where they are, uh, even if they're older than 18, then in the current environment, that's A-OK. -okay. Just ask. And the leaving care should be starting yeah. planning, should be starting work for telling you anything. Yeah. yeah, I know it should. Yes. Thanks. That's yeah. it for me. Yeah. Can I um, make one uh, correction to the record, Mr Shibridge? Yes. Uh, I'd like to correct the record on social housing wait lists. My office has asked for the latest data, as I indicated, some of which has been received, but which I have not been briefed on at this point. And my office has asked if the latest dashboard can be published ahead of my response to my good friend, the member for Kira, Mr Ryan Park's question on notice on this issue to provide Mr Park with the latest and most up-to-date figures. But as I indicated, I'll take the question on notice. Just whilst I'm alone without a leader, have you got any more questions? 
John's got just, one. Right. I just have. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just seize this moment. Just so oh no! Well, no, 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 no. I think no. no I mean it. Well, well, rather than have this delightful debate, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, only, Minister, the only question yeah. I wanted to ask yeah. was one of the concerning bits of evidence that was um, put to the committee was about the uh, prediction from Equity Economics mm -hmm. about a, an extra 16,000 people who might fall into homelessness. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in your views on that research, uh, whether you've got any modelling, what's your uh, take on that? Is this the uh, in-cost report, Mr Graham? Uh, it was yeah. Equity Economics, it was Homelessness New South Wales who oh, right. referred to it in the course of their evidence to the committee. Yeah, look, it's a really good question, Mr Graham. Look, I, obviously I'm concerned uh, about um, uh, what will happen as, as people um, struggle with the cost of living um, and uh, I'm aware of the modelling. Uh, I, I'm not sure if Mr Vivas wants to add anything to it, but certainly I'm going to be monitoring the situation very closely together with the peaks and continue to work with them as best I can. Um, you know, I don't want to see anyone homeless, and, and that's why we, we have a, a commitment which I think is jointly shared by everybody to see uh, an eradication eventually by home, of homelessness, particularly rough sleeping. Um, did you want to add anything to... The report. Um, not, not much, Minister, only to say we do have some assistance available for people who fall into rent arrears as a matter of business mm. as usual, um, but uh, uh, other than that, mm. nothing to add. But yeah. There's no planning to increase that pool for rental arrears assistance, given that we know a series of income supports are going to be lifted in the next few mm. months, and it, you don't need an, uh, an economic report to realise that's going to put a pressure on homelessness. At, at this stage, no, no plans in place, but we are. I do monitor the number, the demand for that product uh, very regularly, and if we need to increase it, obviously I will be the first to put my hand up. Job, the ANU study that you're probably familiar with from August showed that the increase to job seeker and the introduction of job keeper reduced the number of people living in poverty by 32 per cent. Mm. Um, so obviously, as those supplements change, the number of people living in mm. poverty will increase, mm. um, and um, th that that is going to cause housing stress, no doubt. And just referring to that 16,000 number, I'm really looking for a bit of an in indication, Minister, about is that order of magnitude right, or are there reasons why that evidence that was given to the committee might not be right? Can you give us any sense of that? Oh, look, it's, it's hard to crystal ball, Mr Graham. I, I mean, obviously, I, I'm not sure at this point. I'm just doing everything I can to house as many people as I, 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 we possibly can. Uh, I acknowledge it's a really good question. I, I just don't have an answer for you that's probably going to suffice at this point. Thank you. Um, Minister, the, my office has received a series of reports um, from parents um, whose children are in out-of-home care that they've been refused visitation rights during the pandemic. Um, and when they've approached the department, they've received um, conflicting and unhelpful advice about having visitation rights. Um, is there a policy in place about visitation rights? Absolutely. In fact, we've got uh, some practice framework that I think we developed for this period. Um, so I'll turn to... Like, yes, Minister, I'll turn to Simone Check. But essentially, unlike other states, we haven't taken a fixed or dogmatic view. It's... We've tried to assess the health risks, the health risks, but also the needs of particular children. So, if you're a child who is has restoration to your birth family as your permanency goal, then we would be doing moving heaven and earth to maintain uh, contact between that young person and their birth family, for example. Um, so, I'd, my colleagues and I yeah, take just, my way to just add. to add to the secretary's comments, there is guidance provided to DCJ caseworkers that's updated regularly based on health advice. There's also advice provided by the Office of the Children's Guardian on their website um, to all designated agencies. So that's more applicable for non-government organisations. It does change regularly based on the health advice. So where we're at at the moment is a bit like face-to-face -face assessments, is a, is a risk assessment. Um, but we, we are, based on that risk assessment, resuming where it's safe to do so, face-to-face -face visits. Of course, taking things like social distancing and other precautions uh, into place. But I can certainly understand parents were very disappointed uh, when we were in a period where we were, early on, um, just conducting virtual visits, um, but that has 
that's resumed to more of a balance. So right. I don't know if you have anything to add. No, um, I think uh, the other group that we heard from as well were our carers who uh, in some cases were very fearful about the contact visits, particularly our Aboriginal carers, uh, many of whom are mm. older um, and uh, their health concerns were greater. Uh, so we needed to take both into account. Uh, as the Secretary mentioned, we were, we were concerned to see some of our other states make blanket decisions because we thought that that would absolutely disrupt um, plans for restoration particularly uh, and that we were really worried about that. Fortunately, when we look at the 1920 figures, we can see that there are significant increases in those exits so, and we'll be monitoring that. So, so what's the current situation then? So the current situation is a risk assessment on a case-by-case -case basis. If it's considered, based on that risk assessment, safe and appropriate to conduct a face-to-face -face assessment, for instance, in a park where it might be open, then that is to proceed. Um, there are some other considerations, like uh, Ms Walker just mentioned, around carers, Aboriginal people that, we again, we take into account as part of that risk assessment. So it will vary from one child to the next um, in terms of what that might look like. So is part of the current system to allow um, visits but to retain social distancing, so no hugging, no physical contact? So from an NGO point of view, we are leaving that with the agencies to make their risk assessment. Again, we, we want to... I mean, a, a lot of our carers are family members of yeah, great. birth parents. They're close family members. And yeah. so uh, we do need to leave some of those decisions. Well, so, so the feedback I've got is that it's, it's, it's very haphazard. It doesn't seem to be consistent across the state and that people aren't sure what the rules are. Okay. Um, and is there any place they can go for a review or for a... Um, yeah. when they're getting these arbitrary decisions being made. And often they're arbitrary decisions being made by the carers in, re sure. in reality. Is there any way they can go to review? Abs absolutely. Yeah. So in the first instance, depending on who's the agency um, case managing the, the child and the family, <coughs> they should raise their queries um, in, in that um, arena. Secondly, particularly in the case of non-government organisations, if they try to raise their issue with there and don't get a satisfactory resolution, we in every DCJ district have what we call child and family district units and a call can be made there and we'll advocate on behalf, depending on the situation of a carer or a parent or a child for that matter, to resolve that, well then, that issue. Could I ask you, as a matter of urgency, to, to, to share those contacts for the reviews um, with the committee? Because I'm certain I'm not the only... Sure. member sure. who's having sure. these requests and calls um, where those reviews can be can be lodged. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Absolutely, we'll do we'll that. Do that. And uh, I perhaps would undertake for the department to also give you a briefing on that, Mr Shubridge, directly. All right. Well, that, that concludes my questioning. Um, if the government... You'll be unsurprised any? to know that I have absolutely no questions. <laughs> Ms what? Uh, Minister, I just wanted to thank you for coming today, but also to your team to say thank you very much um, during... Um, I'm not going to use that word, but I'm um, doing an extremely difficult time in our history and um, I'm sure the pressures on you have been enormous and we haven't explored those, but just thank you for your work on behalf of the people that you are helping and it was really pleasing, Minister, to see the numbers reduce in the way that they have um, during this difficult time. There's been some very innovative responses. I've had some feedback um, across um, a range of people who've said that the homelessness initiative in particular, which probably got the most publicity, but it was in particular that... Um, that was an immediate and innovative response that um, was very, very helpful. So I just wanted to convey that to you from those members and thank you for those very helpful numbers. Well, well thank you and, and a thank you to all members of the committee as well as members of parliament from all sides that have been in contact throughout this time. I can also place on the record thanks to my ministerial team that have been working incredibly hard with me throughout this time. Uh, they've all been terrific, so thank you very much. All right, Ms Check, Minister, Mr Pritz-Trotto, Mr Vendors and Ms Walker, thank you, thank you all for your thank you. assistance thank you. today.